I'm June Gruber, an Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of Colorado Boulder and Director of this Mental Health Expert Series. I'm delighted to be here today with Dr. Kay Jamison, the Dalio Professor in Mood Disorders and Professor of Psychiatry at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine to speak with her about her work in bipolar disorder. So thanks for being here today, Kay. Delighted. I was wondering if you could uh, say a little bit about the kind of work you've done in this area throughout your career. Well, I, I started off in kind of the more experimental side of psychology and uh, psychopharmacology when I was a graduate student. And then I moved into, I guess, other fields. And then when I got very uh, sick from my first manic episode, I got very interested very quickly <laughs> in mood disorders, particularly, particularly mania, but mania and depression both. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more of that about how you first got started in your career and interest in bipolar disorder. Well, the, the interest in bipolar disorder was very specific to, to getting sick, getting psychotically manic. Uh, I had no particular interest in mood disorders before that. I've always been interested in psychology and I've always been interested in uh, temperament and how people think and the differences in the way people think and experience different levels of curiosity. And I suppose always interested in the arts as well. And one of the great things about studying mood disorders, I think is that you can, it goes the entire intellectual range from, um, you know, neuroimaging and genetics and biology to uh, the arts. And so you, if, if you can't find something interesting in studying mood disorders, you're probably uh, lacking in curiosity. I was wondering, you know, in reflecting on your career, starting in psychology and then through personal experience, becoming an expert in bipolar disorders, when you reflect upon your career trajectory, what stand out to you along the way as some notable frustrations um, as well as successes that you've been able to savor? Well, I think I'm not long on being frustrated for very long. It's not something that Sits, sits well with my temperament. Uh, I think that I'm more inclined to kind of move on to something that's interesting and, and um, that kind of excites my, my brain. Um, I think it's, you know, it's frustrating uh, to have been ill, certainly, because it's taken quite a few years out of my life. Um, but I've been, I think I've been very fortunate. I've been very fortunate in my family. I've been very fortunate in my colleagues who've been terrific uh, and my uh, friends. So it would be hard for me to work up a whole lot of frustration and self-pity. And what about successes in the field? Um, in particular, I, I'd just love to hear more about what it was like to write about your own personal experiences, both for yourself and um, the reception from the public you received. Well, I think one of the great things about, I mean, it, it took me a very long time to write a memoir about being mentally ill for a lot of reasons. I had a professor at a major medical school. I knew I'd get a lot of flack and criticism, which I did. Um, you know, I, I, I knew that would be, you know, that would lose a lot of my privacy and that people would kind of see everything that I did after that point is being related to my illness rather than being related to me as a psychologist or as a person. Uh, so if, you, if, if you're asking about frustration, actually that is kind of frustrating. Um, but I, th I think that the writing the book itself, the actual writing part was of writing an unquiet mind was actually wonderful in the sense that I just come off of co-authoring co a book it was 1,500 pages more than you ever wanted to know about the neuropsychology, the neuroimaging psychology of bipolar illness. So in that kind of book, that kind of academic book, as you well know, you've got a footnote every time you turn around. So you've got to say, yeah, footnote this, footnote that, footnote that. And, and actually, one of the things I'd never thought about, because I hadn't written anything that was personal, um, was that when you write a memoir you don't have to you don't have to footnote it I mean you know so to me it was just a, a, a pleasure and that's it so the writing was a pleasure the the decision to write it was uh, actually pretty stressful um, I, I think that the reaction of my um, 
medical school, uh, Johns Hopkins was extraordinary in terms of being supportive and, and basically said, this is exactly what we should be doing. We should be out a front, you know, in front of the curve in terms of stigma. They could not have been kinder. And, and most of my colleagues were that way. Some of them were not, uh, but mostly people were terrifically understanding. They, the reaction from the public was, it was for the most part wonderful. It was frightening at times. Uh, there are a lot of people out there that are pretty disturbed and who really just on general principle hate people who are mentally ill um, and feel free to express it. You know, not, not so the constraints of politeness and civility don't always apply. Um, so that, you know, that was at times very frightening, but for the most part, people were terrific. And uh, it, it was a great privilege. It, it was a kind of a book tour that went on forever and ever and ever. But what it also meant was that I went all around the country, um, city, town after town, um, Europe, um, and had the great privilege of, of really talking to lots and lots of people about their own experiences with mental illness and the pain and suffering and the pain and suffering that went into having had a family member kill themselves. Um, so in that sense, it, it, was, it was actually quite an extraordinary experience. And you had mentioned that, you know, before this extraordinary experience that there were some challenges in, in deciding to write the book from a kind of personal perspective. Sure. Yeah, I don't know if you would mind saying a little bit more about that and if, you know, what it was like reflecting on those challenges after you had written it. Well, sure. I mean, I thought long and hard about it. It's everything from hospital privileges, state licenses, uh, what people are going to think about you and how they're going to pigeonhole you, uh, which turned out to be true. Um, and I, I think just losing your privacy is, 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 you know, unless you're kind of ravingly narcissistic and you really just love people attending to your trials and tribulations, you know, I think most people aren't that way and I'm not. And I, you know, it was, it was deeply uncomfortable. I think, it, so the personal aspects of it were, were pretty significant. I think also um, the, the fact that I knew I would really have to stop practicing and I, I'd had a very large, uh, I, I ran a very large public mood disorders clinic at UCLA and I had a large private practice at UCLA and I had a large private practice in Washington and, and I loved seeing patients. I mean, I really did. I mean, I, I, I love clinical work. I think it's uh, challenging and interesting and, and rewarding in a hundred thousand ways. But I knew I, that would be a decision that was just uh, not negotiable from my own point of view. Um, so that, that continues probably, I, I would say to be the most, uh, difficult uh, thing that has come out of it. Although I've ended up, you know, talking to people, you know, thousands of students, uh, which has been delightful. I, I try to spend as much time as I can on college campuses because the age of onset of bipolar was this young. Um, mm -hmm. And I spend every time I'm at Hopkins until recently with COVID, but uh, every, every time I'm at Hopkins, I have lunch or, or tea with somebody who, a house staff member, a resident, an intern, or a graduate student who has bipolar illness or depression. And so it, it's, it's not the same as doing psychotherapy, but it's, it's rewarding um, in its own right. So when you think about the future of the field, right, in mental health and mood disorders, where do you see the most important next steps? I think a lot. I mean, the obvious ones are genetics because bipolar illness is so incredibly genetic. Uh, and I think very exciting work is being done in that and neuroimaging and neurobiology. I also think psychology, when I first started studying bipolar illness, the assumption was somehow that it was a psychiatric field and psychologists just didn't do it. And I think one of the great things uh, over the last many years is that people Many, many more psychologists are studying it. And I think the, the aspects of what's, what is it about temperament that is glued onto bipolar illness? How does that affect uh, how you approach your illness? Whether you heal or not heal, what's the difference between treatment and healing? Um, I think the cognitive styles and cognitive differences, bipolar illness is very, has very different outcomes 
and very different ways of uh, presenting itself nat natural course wise. And I think those things are being just beginning to be studied really systematically and well. So, and I think creativity, I think, I think a lot of the intellectual sides of this illness is, is an interesting illness because it does affect the brain so clearly um, and which makes it difficult to study, but also really interesting. Thank you so much. The last question question I had for you is, you know, what advice might you have for others, students, the public, those who might be watching this interview today who are interested in this field? Um, it, it would be hard for me to imagine a more interesting field. As I say, it kind of covers, it covers literature. I mean, my, my personal uh, interests in the arts tend to be toward uh, books and poetry and um, there's just no shortage of people who write really, really, really well uh, who've had, had this illness. And I think the different kinds of thinking about it, but, you know, go for it. I mean, I, th I think that people should, you know, obviously pursue their passions, um, but it's, if, if you're interested in basic science, it's incredibly interesting from the point of view of neuroscience. Um, if you're interested in psychopathology and how people face the world, um, how they learn from adversity. Uh, that's again, one of the things I, I talk with students a lot about is, you know, yes, it's horrible, it's awful, you know, and if it isn't awful, you don't have it, um, but you can pull so much out of it once you're in the clear and you can help other people. You can learn things that other people probably would never learn. And so it's, it's, a, it's a field that is, deeply rich, I think, in human experience, um, imagination, science. I wanted to thank you for your time today and, and also for what an inspiration you've been to so many people, um, including myself as someone who's had a very close family member with bipolar disorder. Your writings, I think, were really what kind of gave vision and hope and momentum to know what to do with that and to try to contribute back and, as you said, find meaning for the field. So. Just want to thank you for your time and all that you've done and continue to do. Well, thank you so much and uh, enjoy the University of Colorado. It's as good as it gets. <laughs>